you hear me? I hear you. Oh my God. It, it, I don't know if it's, yeah, okay, we're good. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. We were just talking about technology fixes, huh? Um, uh, my name is Jeff Larkin, and I'm the Marketing and Communications Specialist at Cornerstone. Today, I'm joined by Hank Hoffmeyer from iContact to discuss the importance of email marketing and how to get started today with a newsletter. But before we get started, as per usual, we have a little bit of housekeeping. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, be sure to leave them in the chat box on your GoToWebinar dashboard, and we will answer them at the end of the webinar. My, or my contact information is right there on the screen if you'd like to get in contact with me. And don't forget to follow us on social media. We post industry and cornerstone updates and information. So visit Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, or YouTube to give us a follow. We're posting all the time out there, um, so check it out. All right, with all that, I'm gonna hand it over to Hank from Eye Contact. Take it away, Hank. All right, I believe I need to share my screen. Wonderful. Awesome, all right. Uh, Jessica, you are seeing the slides, correct? Yes, sir. All right, wonderful. Thank you everybody for joining me on such an early morning, uh, especially if you're on the West Coast, it must be really early. I don't know if any of you are on the West Coast, but bless you if you are. My name is Hank Hoffmeyer. Thank you for joining me. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever won a trophy or award? And yes, I'm warming you up this morning. Take your coffee, put it down, go into the chat. Let's get used to this chat. Let me know if you've ever won a trophy or an award because it feels good, right? You wanna show off what you've won, what you've accomplished, have that sense of pride. For me growing up, I never really played sports. I tried soccer and I tried football. I did not do so well when I played those sports. I am a nerd, I'm a techie. That's why I got into technology and marketing is because that's what I like to do. I'm not seeing any responses in the chat there. Hopefully you're paying attention so that you can learn how to use email marketing today. But let me know if you've ever won one. Even if you didn't, let me know, just so I know the chat's working today because I might ask you a few other questions. There's a thing in sports called MVP or most valuable player and that's the player that does the most work or has the most impact on the game or the season right if sports has an mvp why doesn't e why doesn't marketing and if marketing had an mvp it would be email marketing and that's why we're here to talk about email marketing and a uh, perfect attendance in high school that's something to be proud about and maybe you can get an award and for me when i started at eye contact 12 years ago i can't believe i've been at eye contact for 12 years the first year i was there i got this award if you're looking at me on camera it's uh the eye contact uh, account management excellence award it's heavy i could probably kill someone if i threw this at their head it sits up on my shelf and i look at it every now and then just to remind myself that i need to have continued excellence and again, my name is Hank Hoffmeyer. I'm the digital marketing infotainer. I like to make marketing fun and successful. Feel free to follow me on social media. I'm also on uh, uh, TikTok as well, which is not listed here. I'm at Hank Hoffmeyer on any of the social media channels. If you're gonna connect with me on LinkedIn, the only thing I ask is that you let me know you're on this webinar and why you wanna connect because I do not accept blind invites. This is kind of this weird rule I have. I relaxed it twice and I regretted it both times, uh, but that's the only rule I have is for LinkedIn. Email marketing is not only the MVP, it's also a team player. If you're using other marketing channels, such as social media, maybe you have a website, probably should, and you're doing other things like blogging, email marketing is a great team player. Works well with all those other channels. Now let's take a step back. If you're currently not using email marketing, or maybe you do and you need to be, be reminded why it's successful. It's 40 times more effective than any other marketing channel, social media, pay-per-click, and even direct mail, which is making a comeback because of the pandemic. 61% of American workers say email is important to doing their job. In other words, you're gonna send an email and more than likely they're gonna receive it and hopefully read it. And if B2B, which is this audience, more than likely, uh, most of us um, use email marketing. 83% of B2B marketers use email marketing and know how effective it is. The thing is, everyone uses email. 95% of consumers, if somebody's looking to buy something, use email. 
72% of consumers say email marketing is their favorite method of communication for companies they do business with. Question time now, you got, you got to warm up here, get that coffee in your system, folks. Do you check your email first thing when you wake up in the morning? Go in the chat box, because we also want you to ask questions later. Hopefully you'll have a lot of them because I left time for Q&A. Do you check email when you wake up first thing in the morning? I do. I've tried to stop doing it, but I just can't help myself. My phone's right there on my charger. Maybe I should put it in another room. 80% of people check their email within 15 minutes of waking up. They're going to roll over, grab their phone. The first thing they're doing is checking their email. Again, another reason why email marketing is important. And what I'm trying to tell you is it works. For an ROI perspective, for a conversion perspective, it works. I need to ask this question. Are you with me so far? I, I <laughs> see only uh, not Jessica in the comments here. I need to know if you're still alive and paying attention to me. Or maybe you're multitasking. You're just going to catch the recording later. <laughs> We've got the answers in the uh, question area, and we have a lot of very enthusiastic, yes, I do check my email in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, and it's funny, and uh, now speaking at conferences uh, live, a few times I've had somebody say, they cross their arms and they say, no, I don't. And I say, well, you know what, I'm proud of you. If you can keep doing that, please keep doing it. But uh, I'll just keep going, maybe I'll ask you for some answers down the road. But great, I'm glad you're with me so far because we're gonna keep moving on. So if you're using email marketing or you're getting started, let's make sure you're starting off right. Let's talk about sign-up forms, welcome emails, and content. First and foremost, sign-up forms are an excellent way to add subscribers to your platform, your list, or whatever you wanna call it. An important bit of information is only ask for the information you need. Now, you're a unique audience. If you sell something online, a product or some kind of service, Normally, you only need an email address to be able to send an email and maybe ask for the first name so you can personalize that email. In my opinion, that is all you need to start a relationship. But in the insurance industry and other industries, you might be able to get away with asking for more information, especially if it's for a quote. But if you were to ask me for my first name, last name, email address, the color of the car I drive, how much taxes I paid last year, what city I live in, and if I own a boat or not, I'm probably not gonna give you all that information. I'm gonna leave that form. Only ask for what you need. And again, it's either to start a relationship if it's a general newsletter, or if it's a quote, you might need some specific information, and that is okay. Make sure to add forms to your website and any landing pages you're using. Here's a simple example that ColourPop uses is just the email address on their page. You could put that at the bottom. Bath and Body Works, same thing. And they're actually asking you to confirm the email just to make sure there's no typos, which is good. One thing you could do is add a pop up. Serve a pop up form after somebody's been on your site for a little while. And don't do it once I come to your website. And because maybe I did a Google search for insurance or something, went to your website, and all of a sudden a pop up comes up. I have no idea what you have to offer. I didn't read any reviews. I don't even know if you offer the type of insurance I need. You're all up in my face with this form and I need to fill it out. Give them 20 seconds, 30 seconds, or you can also set it to pop up once somebody scrolls a certain percentage of your website. Or more importantly, you can use what's called exit intent technology, which tells when somebody goes to leave the website to go to, go to a different tab, close the tab, leave the browser that's when the form pops up. Now these examples are giving percentages off. What you might wanna say, don't you wanna save X percent over what you're doing now or something, use some kind of statistic or call to action to get people to fill out that form to get their information. And again, asking for more information is not necessarily bad, but only when you need to. Like restaurants, they ask for your birthday. Why do they do that? Because they offer free or discounted meals on your birthday. I don't know about you, but I love free food or cheaper food if I can. Also ask people what they want in an email. Bangkok Newsletter does a great job of asking if you want to know about food in Bangkok, nightlife, or maybe you just want to subscribe to PDF Magazine. Maybe you have tips or tricks about insurance. Maybe you want to provide information to them around that once per month and it's not really selling anything or you want to provide a quote give them the option to opt in to get other information from you 
or strictly information that's necessary to them, like the quote. I like to think that QR codes are making a comeback. And I just added this as an example. Uh, you can brand QR codes and put a, a logo on it like we did here at iContact. That QR code will uh, bring you back to iContact's website to sign up. I used QR code monkey for this. If this is something you're looking to do, you can bring this up on your phone while you're networking so people can scan it to go to a landing page to sign up for a report maybe you have or something like that. The pandemic really breathed a new life into QR codes because they're being used for menus at restaurants and people are okay with scanning them now. And I'm getting you set up because I need you to have your phone ready because I'll have an uh, item for you at the end, an asset, the end of this webinar. And the only thing you need to do is scan the QR code to get it. This one, like I said, goes to I contact site. It's just an example. But a QR code is a great way to get people to go to your forums, landing pages, or to get something that you want to send them. All right, you're collecting email addresses, you have forms on your website, what are they going to get? Really, I mean, are you gonna send them emails? More importantly, when are you gonna send them emails? It's important to send a welcome email, and a welcome email is the first email that you send when you get a email address. You don't wanna wait a month from when you get that email address to send them that first email. They'll probably forget who you are, mark the message as spam, or ignore it. I went to a sporting goods store their physical location a few months back. And I noticed on the window as I was walking in, sign up for our email newsletter and get 30% off your first purchase. I signed up on my phone. I sat there and I waited nothing came right away. I sat down on the bench outside and I was watching people cause I'm a people watcher and check my email every now and then. Waited about 20 minutes, never received the email. On purpose, I went to one of their competitors to buy the product that I was going to buy at this store just because I did not get that coupon. I got the coupon, but it was three days later. I was not not going to make a special trip out to save 30% on something else I was going to buy. And I was kind of disappointed that they didn't send me that welcome email with my 30% off right away. You wanna make sure you send it right away. And especially if you're at a conference or you're somewhere where you're collecting email addresses offline, add them to your email platform as soon as you get back, as soon as you can, upload them and use automation to go ahead and trigger that welcome message to go out. It sets the expectations. It reminds people of who you are and why you're sending them an email. We wanna send you information about how to save money on how to reduce risk of those types of things. It really helps build and set that relationship. You can also add your social media links if you're using social media to get people to also follow you on social media. It's something that is expected People want to see those first emails come in. And again, it just sets that reminder of here I am, you signed up, I want to have a relationship with you. And it's up to you if you want to have an offer in there, a discount or something or a free consultation, whatever it is, put that into the welcome email. By sending welcome emails, you're going to be more effective with your email campaigns. The welcome emails have a very high percentage of open rates. 74% of people expect that welcome email. It has a high click-through rate, 26% click-through rate. An average click-through rate is three to 5%, folks. So 26.9 for, for a welcome message, that's gonna be the most effective email you're gonna send. And they're 56% more effective than your standard newsletter. This is your MVP of your email program, it's your welcome message. Let's look at some examples like Michael's thanking you for signing up, huge header, thanks for signing up, telling you how things are gonna work and they're giving you a coupon. Uh, Litmus B2B, hey, woohoo, you're in, You know, take advantage of some of the tips, case studies and resources we have to offer. And we have Surf Stitch. I love how to use a, an image at the top and text over that. And again, they're using an incentive. And then we have uh, otter.ai. They're saying, tell us how you plan to use our product. Believe it or not, if somebody replies to your email, that is a great form of engagement and it keeps your emails going to the inbox. Let's switch it up a little bit and start talking about the type of content that you should use with your email marketing programs. When I open my inbox in the morning, this is usually how it looks to me because I have so many emails. My eyes just start to lose focus and everything just looks jumbled to me. Oh my God, I have 300 emails I have to look at. The first thing people see when they open their inbox is going to be the subject line. Make sure to use personalization by 
gathering the first name in your form and using the first name in the subject line so that people know that it's for them and it stands out in the inbox. Use emoji to help stand out in the inbox. Emoji is safe to use now. Years ago, there was some question about whether or not it harmed your ability to get into the inbox, but make sure that you use relevant emoji that's tied to the subject line so that it makes sense. The length of your subject line should be about six to 10 words in length. Otherwise, you run the risk of getting cut off in the inbox and people may not really understand what the email is about and not open it. Take advantage of a feature called split testing or A-B testing. Take one version of your email, copy it, and for a subject line test, just change the subject line. You're gonna send version A to 10% of the list you wanna send to, and version B to another 10%. Wait about 24 to 48 hours, let the results bake in, and whichever one has the higher open rates, usually the winner, you're gonna send that to the remaining 80% of your list. You're sending the most effective email to the majority of the people on your list. I worked with a client that said, I don't know why everyone doesn't do split testing often because it's like getting free opens with every send, which is true. You're gonna send the better performing email to your list. And a tip or pro tip is use the, what's called preview text. Uh, this is something eye contact has with, that you can put in and it's an extension of your subject line i like to think of it as what robin is to batman they make up the dynamic duo you have your subject line in bold and then you have the unbolded text right after which is the preview text so we have the two-day super sale this friday and saturday only get 20 percent off a uh, coupon and 25 percent off footwear coupon so it's an extension of your subject line allows you to get past that six to ten words for your subject line also use action words like act now, save, limited time offer, last chance, new video if you're doing video, learn how, learn how to save, right? And find out why. Maybe uh, use other things like get your report in the subject line or the pre-header. Get people to take action and get excited around what's going on. Speaking of subject lines, like here's a few examples of subject lines that had really, really awesome open rates. And you might ask, well, how are they getting these open rates? Well, I'm glad you asked that because at the end of today's webinar, I wanna give you Eye Contact's ultimate subject line guide, 501 examples of really good and really bad subject lines, also broken down by industry and types of email, like welcome message, broadcast, split testing. It's a great report and will help you get more of your emails opened. When creating your emails, use the 60-40 rule. A ratio of 60% text and 40% images. If you use all image emails, there's a potential that your email may get flagged as spam and not see the light of day. Use a variety of content and different types of templates to change things up so the reader does not get bored with what you're sending. Adhere to your branding. In other words, if you have a website, you have a logo, you have branding, you have certain colors, make sure that translates into your emails. Any images that you put into your email should have what's called alt text, or it's the text that shows if people don't load images, which will make them want to enable images. In other words, if you have your logo at the top left of the email, don't simply put logo as your alt text, put company name helps you save money on insurance or something like that to help them know that they should enable images. And again, test, test, test. Not only can you test subject lines, you can also test your body copy, images, length, a whole bunch of different things. You just need to know what to test. And make sure not to test more than one element at once. Otherwise, you won't know what moved the needle in a positive or negative direction. When you're creating emails, make sure they look professional and clean. I love to use this example by Apple. They let the product speak for itself. It's a large image of their product some simple text and a buy now button. And they make use of something called white space, which is a lot of space around the content, which makes everything easily consumable. Storied, kind of similar, it's called negative space. They have a lot of negative space and they're using like neutral tones and black and white images to convey emotion. And they're definitely using stills that make you want to take action to click through to read these articles or watch the videos. If you have a lot of content you need to share in your emails, use something called the classic Z pattern. When we read, especially in English, we read from left to right and down. 
use this type of method or this type of layout to drive people downward in your email image text text image have it be going down so that people scroll and see the remainder of your content otherwise if you're only highlighting one particular product or service you can use an inverted pyramid large hero image at the top maybe some text in it if you want to text that's a little bit more narrow than the image and then the button it's even more narrow your eyes kind of just naturally flow down the email great way to get people to read through your email also make sure you use something called the squint test create your email step back from your monitor and squint really hard and make the image a little bit blurry can you still kind of make out what contents in there and see that white or negative space if it kind of resembles the actual email and you can still read a little bit you pass the squint test if everything's so jumbled together you can't tell where where one text ends where one image starts where colors differentiate you're failing the test humans are visual by nature we love to consume images that's why instagram became so popular but then came video make sure to use both use really good images Try not to use a lot of stock photography if you can, but uh, sometimes in certain industries you have to, and that's okay. Just be careful with what you choose. Then use video or a link to a video in your emails so that you can convey more information. And people tend to want to consume more content in video. And right now, 80% of marketing content is video, folks. That's how important video is. And why it works is, People retain 95% of what they hear and see in a video versus 10% in text only. Videos help convey the value of the service you're offering. The most important thing that you can do with your email campaigns or with your marketing campaigns in general is make sure you're offering value. I like to use the bank analogy. When you're creating content, especially email content, you want to make sure you're making deposits. Your deposits are valuable bits of information. I remember State Farm sending me emails and I still get them every now and then and I still read them. I have auto insurance through them. Maybe I am thinking about buying homeowners insurance. Should they be trying to sell to me every week, every day through email? No, but what they could do is just send me emails around what matters to me how to keep my car running properly especially if i'm going on a large trip or a long trip i'm going to texas at the end of this week you know i need to change my oil check my uh, air cleaner maybe there's a couple other things and maybe they can remind me what i need to check they could tell me how to keep my home safe from uh, burglaries or from fire uh, then every now and then they can kind of trickle in hey, we noticed that you don't have homeowner's insurance through us. Do you want homeowner's insurance? And that's when you make the withdrawal. But one thing you wanna do is make sure that you're making more deposits than withdrawals. So you're gonna deposit a bunch of valuable content and at some point you're gonna ask for a withdrawal in the form of a conversion. If you have not read Gary Vaynerchuk's book, Jab, 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 Right Hook, I highly recommend it. Same premise, Jab, 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 Right Hook, value, 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 sell. Gary really talks about it in sense of social media, but it works with email marketing as well. Now let's talk about some extra points. It's time to step up to the three point line and go for that extra you know, three point shot or you know, football, the extra point after the score. Let's talk about segmentation and automation and how this can help you bring your email marketing to the next level. Segmentation is when you take your list of subscribers and you create a filter. Let's say it's type of insurance, like we just mentioned, homeowners and car. You can say, hey, I wanna send an email about homeowners insurance. What you need to do is take your list and filter those that are interested in homeowners insurance. That would be your segment. I used to always use, you know, like favorite color. You know, if you get somebody's favorite color, you just segment by that color. Same thing, segmented emails, have a higher click-through rate. In other words, if you send the right message to the right person, they're more apt to click through. 88% of users are more likely to respond in email favorably if it looks like it's been specifically created for them. In other words, if State Farm kept trying to sell me the homeowner's insurance every single day, every single week, I would get, a, get frustrated and probably 
opt out of their emails. But if it's created tastefully, uh, they're targeting me with information of, of how to save more money on my auto insurance, et cetera, and then every now and then tell me about homeowner's insurance. I'll probably listen up and read those a little bit more. All right, let me ask you a question. This is a fill in the blank, and uh, Jessica, I might need your help on this one. According to the Digi DMA, the Digital Marketing Association, marketers have found a blank increase in email revenue from segmented campaigns. Let's go ahead and take a guess. I'm gonna see if I can get the questions up while that's coming. Or I can see them now. What percentage of increase in revenue do you think marketers have seen by actually sending people emails that people want to read? Don't be shy. And I'm looking at both questions and chat. All right, 65, 50%. Thank you, William. Thank you, Amanda. Let's try for triple digits. I wanna see who gets the closest. Hopefully this exercise will make you wanna use segmentation more. I need at least one guess and there you go. William, 125. Well, what if I told you or showed you this, whoa, where we go? Ah, what about if I told you this number? Segmentation works, folks. It helps you send the right message to the right person so that they will convert more. 760% increase. Wow, who would have thought of that? In my opinion, there's four pillars of segmentation. The first one's demographic. That's age, gender, income, education, and occupation. Then we have psychographic. This is lifestyle, values, concerns, personalities, attitudes, and AIO activities, interests, and opinions. You might ask, hey, this information is great, Hank, but you told me the only thing I really need is the email address and first name, right? Or maybe what type of insurance they're looking for if that's something you need in the insurance industry. How do I get this information? This is wonderful, I need it. I want that 760%. I, I wanna know how I can increase my conversions. Surveys are a good way to get this. You can send out a survey after you've had somebody on your list for a while and mention to them why you're looking for this information. You can try to incentivize them to do that. Choose a winner or everyone gets a gift card. You can also drive people back to their profile. Like in eye contact, you can say, please go to your profile. Here's a link. Please update this information. It will help us send you more relevant emails. Humans want to be helpful. They, they would love to help you out. If you tell them what you're looking for, and it makes sense for them to do so. Okay, the third one is behavioral. What are they doing and not doing? Are they opening and not or not opening your emails? Clicking or not clicking your emails? Do they visit your website? You can use Google Analytics and you can connect website data to your email marketing platform. You know, what signals are they giving you? Are they engaged? Are they not engaged? And I always like to look at our VIPs. In other words, so many marketers are worried about what people are not doing, not opening and not clicking they're not really treating the people that are opening and clicking or doing business with you accordingly. Make sure to show them some love, give them some special treatment so that they do feel special. Last but not least would be geographic. You know, where are they? Maybe you only offer your insurance in certain areas, certain geographical areas. It's important to know that if you wanna target people. In other words, if you cannot sell in Connecticut, why would I want your emails if I was in Connecticut? It'd put a bad taste in my mouth. Or maybe you're looking to expand into another area and you can specifically target people in those areas with a new line of service or something. It's a great idea. Just remember that today's consumer is a little bit different than what they used to be. I call today's consumer the empowered consumer because everybody has one of these, a mobile device. They can take that device, they can look up information around pricing, do some comparison shopping in a timely manner. They're gonna be very vocal about what they're doing if they have a good or bad experience with you or with any company. I could have went on that uh, sports company's website or you know Google and, and rated them badly just because they didn't send me a welcome message. I didn't do that, but people can. They're more apt to leave negative reviews than positive, but people do leave positive reviews. Consumers are committed. If you give them value, they'll give you their business. They're just looking to make sure that they're not being overcharged and that they're being supported. And you know, we're global. People can do research from wherever they are. They can buy things wherever they are, whenever they want to. And they're concerned, right? We, we live in an environment right now where people are worried about their health. They're worried about income. You know, we're worried about gas prices right now for sure. Um, but they just have a lot going on in their life. You need to make them feel good and build that relationship with them. 
Uh, build KLT. Does anybody know what KLT stands for? KLT. In your industry, you definitely need to build KLT, and it's no like and trust. If people know, like, and trust you, they will do business with you. And probably many of you get business through referrals. It's a great way to grow your business. You can also get referrals for your email marketing campaigns by getting people to refer other people to sign up for your newsletters if they're worthy enough, if you're making enough deposits in your bank account. One way to work with these empowered consumers is by using automation, email marketing automation. Marketing automation is convincing people to need what you provide at the right time. If I need insurance, there's a specific window that I'm normally looking for, or maybe you can convince me to change who I'm using. Marketing automation is a great way to start converting more. Nine out of 10 marketers use more than one form of marketing automation. And again, I could quiz you, but by implementing marketing automation, you're leads can increase by 451%. We already talked about sending the right message to the right person, but now we're starting to talk about sending the right message to the right person at the right time. You need to feed the machine with marketing automation. You need to feed it data. This is all of the segmentation criteria I told you about, the four pillars. What type of insurance are people looking for? Where are they? maybe income level, those bits of information help you create triggers and create that journey for marketing automation. Then you have triggers. Did they open that email? If not, send them this email. Did they click on this link to get uh, an estimate? No, let me go ahead and follow up with them and nurture them a little bit more. Speaking about nurturing, it's a great way to use automation to send your welcome email or not just a welcome email, it could be a welcome series. And this is a great opportunity for you to stay in front of someone while they're in that decision-making process and then use triggers along the way. So we have our empowered consumer. They go to our website and we use that exit intent technology pop-up to get somebody's email address and they fill out the form, first name, last name, and then let's say we know they're looking for you know, a specific type of insurance. We can go ahead and send them that welcome email. Welcome. Here's a warm hug. Here's what you can expect from us. Uh, we hope you'll stay in the know with us and start to build a relationship with us. And a few days later, you send an emotional appeal letter. This is where you beg them for your business. No, I'm just kidding. This is where you appeal to their emotions and you start telling them about your company and organization. We're a family-run organization. We've been in business for 80 years. We really want to treat you well. Here are some testimonials and case studies from us. Try to get them to get the warm fuzzies about your organization. Next, a few days later after that first email, you send them a differentiator email. This tells people why you're different than your competitors or why people should choose you. See what we're doing here? We're building this value, right? We're, we're, we're making these deposits and then we're gonna go ahead and make the withdrawal or, or give them the right hook, which is the incentive to either have a call, uh, purchase, sign up, whatever it is, you want them to convert. This is a simple way of using automation. Now, I have a few examples within iContact. You can start email series or email automations in different ways. One way is when somebody subscribes. You add them to a list or they're automatically added to a list from a form. You can go ahead and set up a nurture series that sends them a message right away, a welcome message, and then three days later, the differentiator. And there's some checks and balances in here. In other words, if someone did not open that differentiated email, uh, we can resend that. And if they did, we can send them the emotional appeal email. In other words, try to get back into the inbox and get recognized if somebody did not read the email. So you can set this up, have different checks and balances along the way, and send emails to certain people if you want to. This is a great way to do a welcome series when somebody subscribes to your list, newsletter, whatever you want to call it. Then maybe we have a specific date. Uh, this would be uh, an event or a webinar. Maybe you're going to do your own webinar on insurance. You put the date in and then you say 10 days before the event, send this message. Maybe it's to get them to sign up or register for the webinar. Five days before, anyone who did not register, you know, remind them to register. Anyone who did, you can go ahead and say, Here's the login information for the webinar. We look forward to seeing you three days before. It can be, again, register, and then those that did not, 
uh, or those that did, you know, hey, the event starts in three days, day of, hour before, you can set some in there. And then a day after, you can thank everyone who attended. As long as you have that information, you update that information, thank everyone who attended, give them the recording. And if they did not attend, you can also send them an email and maybe get them to opt in to something to be able to see the recording if it's that valuable. You can also use something called custom date. Uh, this would be maybe a subscriptions expiring and insurance policies expiring. Uh, so you that's a unique date to each subscriber. So similar to the previous example, 30 days before, you're going to remind them of their subscription or their policy expiring seven days before. If they have not renewed, you can remind them one day after that it is expired and now they're at risk, so on and so forth. This is a great way if you have a specific date around like an anniversary date, a date that they um, had their first consultation, uh, policy dates, expiration dates, all those things, custom date and uh, automation is great to use. All right, I need to call timeouts, check in here, make sure you're drinking enough coffee, drinking enough water, getting enough fluids. If you're still with me, I hope you are, not seeing much new in the chat or in the questions, but if you have questions, make sure you're gonna put those in there. I always say put them in now before you forget because I want you to make I want you to get value out of today's webinar and get any questions you have answered. Uh, but we're going to keep going here. What do you think is the best use of email automation? What is one of the best ways that you can automate your email campaigns so that you're more effective? No one's going to get this, but I just want to make sure everybody's still paying attention. What is the best use of automation? We didn't cover it yet, so it's not an, it's not a, a rem, rem, remember quiz. All right, you guys must be doing a lot of multitasking today. All right. <laughs> the best use of automation is being clean as a whistle. That's a hint. It's list hygiene, the act of clean, cleaning out old inactive email subscribers in order to improve your email deliverability and your campaign engagement. It's a good opportunity to reintroduce yourself to people who have not seen your emails in a while and reminds them, use emojis, use a specific subject line to make sure that they see it and open it. Um, it helps increase your KPIs, your clicks, your ROI and your opens. And the most important thing folks is every time you send an email, it's being graded. In other words, if somebody has a Gmail, Yahoo, or, or business domain, when you send an email, these providers like Gmail, Yahoo, whoever they're using, are looking at these emails and saying, are people engaging with this email? Are you opening? Are they clicking? Are they going into the spam folder and saying it's not spam? What happens is every time it's graded, when good things happen like opens, clicks, starring, going into the spam folder and pulling it out, it's called TINS. This is not spam. It's a marketing term. When they do that, they show, I want these emails and the sender is relevant and they're sending relevant emails. When bad things happen like bounces, unsubscribes, spam complaints, and believe it or not, when people actually just disregard your email and ignore it, that hurts you. It brings your credit rating, your credit score, your grade down. It's called a domain reputation. I like to think of it as a credit score. And if you have a low credit score, more of your emails are going to go to the spam folder. It's true. That's why you want to remove people that are inactive. You can always add them back later. And it's five times cheaper to turn back an inactive customer or a subscriber to being active again than getting somebody new. You lose about 25% of your list every year. Therefore, you need to make sure that you're cleaning out folks that are just disengaged and make sure you're growing people by using your signup forms. It's a good chance to let your customers decide what they want. Again, give them the option of what types of emails to receive or maybe change the frequency. Make sure that you're using list hygiene. It's very important. According to Litmus, 43% of Gmail subscribers click the spam button rather than unsubscribe from emails. Again, hurting you. They had to get to a point, whether it was maybe that one email is horrible and they marked you as spam, but maybe they're getting the emails and at some, some point they're just lazy, they're gonna click spam. So how often should you clean your list? Well, I already know that these Q&A types of webinars are not for you folks. Uh, I would ask you, is it once a week, once a month, every six weeks, once a year, or never? 
Well, we all know it should be never because of what I previously said. And you're probably guessing, well, how often is it really that I should clean my list? I'm not gonna have you go through the pain of guessing here, but really what it comes down to, should you do it weekly or monthly, we're narrowing it down here, really depends on your frequency. If you send uh, every week, I would say, do a cleanup every six months. Uh, if it's you know once a month, do it every year or once every 12 months. Simply identify people that are non-openers and non-clickers. It used to be identify non-openers because anybody who did not open your emails, probably not going to open it. If it haven't opened in a year, are they gonna open your next email? Probably not. But with Apple, thanks to Apple, there's been some changes in the email industry. Who would have thought email changed? What happens if somebody's using an iPhone, iPad, or a Mac, and they use the built-in email platform, no matter what email service provider you use, Gmail, Yahoo, Apple, whatever it is, if you're using the Apple app, and that my phone's not even turned on, so it's, on, it's locked, it's on, but it's locked. If you send me an email, and I'm using the email client built into my iPhone, I automatically register as opening that email. It's part of their privacy feature. In other words, it's a false signal. I didn't open it. I may not have opened your last four emails, but I count as an open. That's why I'm starting to recommend using Clicker, somebody who has not clicked an email in the last six months, not clicked an email in the last year. And you need to make sure your call to actions are on point so that you can make sure you're giving people that opportunity. And let's break down a journey of doing this list hygiene. You're gonna automate your messaging, right? Your first message is gonna be, we miss you. Let them know why you're getting in touch with them. You know, we noticed we haven't been opening our emails. Remind them who they are, you know, who you are and why they signed up in the first place and give them an opportunity to change the frequency or the type of content they receive. And the next one is that please come back. Wait, wait a few days or a week, check to see who did not open that first one or click in that first one and then send them a special incentive maybe to come back or just remind them that, hey, you haven't been opening our emails. And the last one is, is this goodbye, right? And maybe you could tell them to follow you on your social platforms if they see it and that's what they prefer. You can get them to do that. You really just want to try to give them an opportunity to come back and receive your messages. Otherwise, let them go. Let them go. You can add them back later. And more importantly, it helps your email deliverability, as I mentioned. All right, one more example of an automation series for a uh, you know, win back or a re-engagement campaign, as it's called. You know, so everyone in here shows the last open data within the last six months. They'll automatically be put into a segment based on triggers, right? What they're doing and not doing. Right away, I'm gonna send them that, are we break, breaking up uh, subject line? I don't know about you, but if somebody's breaking up with me, I'm gonna open that email. If they're telling me they're breaking up via email, I'm probably gonna open that. Wait five days and if they didn't open or click in the, in the, in the first one, uh, don't be a ghost, right? This is the subject line here. Again, reiterate what's going on and. You know, do you want to continue to send emails, but you don't want to flood their inbox? Then 10 days after, here are the divorce papers. We mean it. And then automatically after 20 days, remove anyone who's not engaged with the first three emails. You can automate your list hygiene. It used to be manual, but now you can automate it. Some examples from Chipotle, they're giving you an opportunity to click in or out. Uh, then we have Rue, it's just kind of simple. And I love how Kaizen's using a, a dog and a stuffed animal put together, how cute, right? To get you to come back. Um, here's one from JetBlue, right? This is kind of like a case study in a way. They're playing with the idea of breaking up. Like I said, I love the Band-Aid. They're asking you to choose what types of emails you want. They're empathetic to the inbox being full. And they show you that they're understanding and they're caring. You can always come back later. I really love this example. I love the graphics. It's, it's clean. It's got a lot of white space. I, I heard one of you. Um, then we have type form. Uh, they doing the same thing. They notice the inactivity and they're calling it out. They're asking direct questions. And there's one CTA, get inspired by the template gallery. It shows that they open the email and they engaged with it because it's a strong call to action. And again, they're showing that they understand that, you know, hey, you might not want all these emails and that's okay. I love those examples. So it's test time. I hope you're taking notes and paying attention. Um, I'm kind of worried because of your inaction and in chat here, but get your questions ready. But I'm just kidding about the test. Um, want to make sure you have your digital playbook for the MVP of marketing, which is email marketing. Playbooks can be daunting at first, but once you study them and memorize them, you're usually pretty good. So let's recap. Your takeaways for today out of the huddle is going to be knowing that email marketing is the best marketing tool 
out of any other type of channel or tool you're going to use for marketing has the highest ROI, especially if you use it effectively. Make sure to always be continuously growing your fan base. Create great looking emails with white and negative space. Use the squint test and offer valuable content. Make those deposits so that you don't, don't overdraw your, your bank account, your email marketing bank account. And last but not least, earn those extra points by using segmentation and automation with some of the examples I gave you. Let email marketing work hard for you. It will overachieve and earn you a championship if you let it, and you can also win awards like the crystal one that I got. MVPs get trophies, right? I consider you an MVP for putting up with me through this presentation. I wanna now induct, induct you into the Eye Contact Email Marketing Hall of Fame. You're now an Eye Contact Email Marketing Expert, and you might say, wow, that's a pretty badge. How do I get it? Well, if you scan this QR code, I'm gonna, number one, I'm going to give you the subject line guide with the 501 examples of the great and horrible subject lines broken down by industry and type, as well as your badge. This is going to be where you're going to sign up for my newsletter. I send out a journal. I call it everything that I've experienced in the previous month. It might be a tip, strategy, tools that I found to be helpful, information, and I'll also let you know about other upcoming webinars from my contact. I hope you'll stay in touch with me. Maybe you can give me some tips on how to do my email newsletter better. But with that, I'd like to thank you. I definitely want to spend some time answering some questions. And don't forget to connect with me on social media, but always remember my rule for LinkedIn. And with that, Thank you. Awesome. That was awesome, Hank. Um, a lot of really great information, even for me, as I've been doing email marketing for Cornerstone for five years, I've definitely taken something from this. Um, so I actually have a couple questions for you, but we also have um, one from a broker. Um, we keep policyholders in a CRM, which has marketing automation built in, and they haven't used that feature before. Do you have an opinion on whether these CRMs are efficient for the task or less efficient compared to subscribing to a standalone program focusing on only email automation? What are the pros and the cons? That, that's a good question. It really comes down to user experience. A lot of times you'll have a CRM that has marketing built in and usually it comes down to what part of it was built first. Now, ACT, I know it was a CRM before it was a marketing tool. A lot of times the CRM is great, but sometimes the features, usage, whatever you want to call it on the other side, the marketing side are to be desired. Now, maybe ACT has their ACT together and it works great. The benefit is the data is right there. You can use the data and it's automatically in that tool and hopefully you're saving money by doing that. Um, if not, if, if a lot of what I just said is not true, in other words, it's not easy to get the data uh, there's issues with it not having certain features you want or there's bugs or you're not getting support. Most times you can integrate different platforms into eye contact. We have customers that use HubSpot as a CRM and they connect to us and integrate with eye contact to send the emails. So it just really matters is, is it a good fit for you? Does it do what you need? Does it make your day easier or harder? And you know, does it hurt your pocketbook is probably the three things. Does it make your job easier or harder? And is it cost effective? Those are the three questions you need to ask yourself. All right. Um, how do you reach prospects who have not yet subscribed to your email? That's a great question. And it comes down to marketing. It comes down to how you want to do marketing. You want to do organic, you want to do paid, you want to do both. A lot of times budgets are really constrained for when it comes to paid media like pay-per-click and in insurance, pay-per-click is going to be kind of expensive because it is a highly competitive market, but maybe you can find some kind of a niche, um, use what's called long tail keywords. In other words, um, uh, Jessica, remind me, what kind of insurance probably is the most prevalent among this, in this audience today? Uh, health insurance, employee benefits and individual all right, so take the term health insurance. Uh, probably, I, I mean, I don't even, I don't even want to guess what the the bid, the average bid for that term is. It's probably going to be ten to twenty dollars, if not more, uh, per click. Uh, but what you want to do is say, you know, health insurance in my area, health insurance in Connecticut. I don't know why I'm using Connecticut. I'm nowhere near there. Uh, but long, what they call long tail searches. Uh, if you do that, you could save a little bit of money. Maybe you don't get as much traffic, but you're keeping your costs down. 
then you turn to organic social media and not only push content out, say through Instagram, and I know it's hard with insurance, you, there's certain limitations, but you can be creative. Uh, Instagram, TikTok is hot right now. I see so many lawyers doing good. Uh, I see contractors doing awesome. Everybody thinks it's for the younger folks, but the algorithm is so favorable right now. But then you have a link in your bio that goes back to your website and you have a sign up form there. Uh, Facebook, Facebook groups where you can share value, create your own group, but don't always promote your service or you know your offerings uh, and answer questions. You, you need to build a community is what it is. You're not only offering you know the, the insurance, you're offering the information and knowledge you have to build that KLT, know, like, and trust to get people to sign up. Then everything needs to fall in place, right? You have your organic efforts, but not only outbound, look at other accounts and people posting like con if you work with general contractors or you know uh, service industries you know for health insurance small business do searches for those and start engaging with people's posts and get and helping them uh with their business a little bit and bring them back to you your emails need to be on point you need to offer value so that you don't do all this hard work paid and organic advertising to only let them down with the email and they either ignore your emails or they unsubscribe or marketing messages spam. Hopefully that was enough information. So would you recommend then um, starting with email with your current clients and then moving into doing all that stuff? Yeah, so current clients definitely start putting out good information and then ask people to forward it on. Did you enjoy what you read? Forward this to someone. This way you can get into other people's inboxes as well as you know, share it online. You know, you can, most, most platforms you can have an archive link where it's, it's the link to the email and you can share that um, out on social media, et cetera. It, it, once you, it's, it's almost like a snowball. Once you start doing some things, it starts growing and doing more. It's hard to get started, but don't, 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 don't get uh, discouraged. It takes time to build that community. The brand recognition is what it's about, eye contact, it's a little bit harder for us to get brand recognition uh, than some of our competitors that have a huge budget. They're owned by larger organizations that have a lot of money. Uh, they they can just get out there. They can do podcasts. They can do video, you know, editing and all this stuff where we're a little bit smaller. So we have to work a little bit harder. Um, so before you were talking about the 60-40 ratio with um, emails, um, with images to text, um, and then you had also mentioned um, that there was a an image that was kind of larger with a little bit of text over it, and then you had to scroll down to get to the content. Do images in an email need to be shorter than the screen, or will users automatically scroll down to go see that button? It really depends. Um, if you've built that trust and recognition with your subscribers, they are going to read more of your content. But for newer folks or you know, folks that haven't been on your list on, they may not. And that's called a hero image. And you want to try to get as enough information, what, what's called above the fold, like you said, before you scroll, that makes sense. So if it is a hero image, I shared the one that had a text over it. So put, you know, your call to action or whatever it is on that image and then have text and a button. Um, on a mobile device, everything should scale and, and go down but you might want to look at it before you send it. And that's why we recommend testing it, whether it's to a couple email addresses you might have or using a service like Email on Acid to do some, uh, some previews. Okay. Um, we have another question regarding that CRM integration. When you say integrate data from other CRMs into eye contact, does eye contact just need the email addresses and maybe the first names transferred or what other data needs to be transferred? Really, the only thing we need is the email address because that's we're an email platform, right? You need to send emails, it needs to go to an email address. I recommend first name so that you can personalize the emails. Hey, John, or even in the body, hey, John, comma, thank you for signing up for our newsletter. But then again, I spoke about segmentation and automation. It would be good to have more information. In other words, you know, if you need location information, because again, you only have policies in certain states. It would be good to ask people what state they live in and I tell them why if it's a sign-up form, if you're asking for it up front. And if it's a CRM, hopefully you have more of that data. You could bring over whatever you want. We have things called standard fields, like first name, last name, email address, and most of like address and phone number information. 
you can add custom fields like favorite color, birthday, or insurance type. You know, all those things you can bring over. It just depends on what you want to bring over and what makes sense for you. Um, you know, obviously, I want the uh, a low barrier to to bring somebody into using email marketing and bring them the data over. But the more you bring over, the more you can do with it now or later. You can bring it over later, but whatever makes sense to bring over. You, if how many employees a company has is something irrelevant, you'll never use it in your email marketing. There's no need to bring it over. But if you wanted to target people that work for a company that has 500 employees or more, that data makes sense. But you can also use your CRM, create a segment over there, export the email addresses and put them into eye contact. So you could do pre-segmentation or you can bring that over to eye contact and do the segmentation there. Great questions. Um, so I've been seeing more and more often with the people that I follow um, with their emails, um, and I've been seeing it more and more where people just use text or they'll kind of write like a, a blog post and send it out to their email list. What do you think about that, um, that style? Do you think that's effective? It depends. If you're seen as like a consultant or a, uh, what do you want to call it, public figure in a way, that's okay because it almost feels like a one-on-one -on -one conversation. With with email, you can make everything feel like a one-on-one -on -one conversation, especially with the personalization. It makes it feel like it's to that one person. Email marketing is the only tool you can send to 10,000 people at once and make it feel like it's one-on-one. -on -one. So that does make sense. Um, if you're a small insurance broker and you want to have that small intimate relationship with your audience, that makes sense to so just do all text and some hyperlinks here and there because it makes it look like you created it in Gmail, Outlook, and you're sending it out. But if you're a, an organization where you have a lot of images on your website, people go there often, and they're used to seeing images and, and watching videos, it makes sense to add those to your email. And you can test it too. You can say, hey, I've been using images. Let me go ahead and test uh, just a, a plain text one with some links and see which one does better. All right, um, that's all the questions that I see. Um, if you guys have any additional questions, feel free to email them to me at jlarkin at crnstone.com and I will forward them over to Hank. Um, and of course, if you're interested in any of eye contact services, you can contact Hank or you can email me and I'll get you over to Hank as well. The recording for this webinar is also going to be available on the Cornerstone Resource Center along with all the other webinar recordings from this series and another. It'll probably take me a day in order to get that stuff uploaded. Um, so just look out for it on the Resource Center. And if you have a few minutes after the webinar, please take some time to fill out the survey so we can learn what kind of content you're most interested in and how we can improve the series. Hank has joined us for the last, I think, three or four years at this point uh, because people are really enjoying his content. So um, make sure you fill out that survey and let us know what you think. And I'd like to thank Hank for joining us once again today and for offering his expertise. And everyone have a great day and stay safe out there. Thank you, everybody.